I want to spend a few minutes together today talking about how to profit from buyers against some pretty stiff headwinds facing the real estate and mortgage industries. You know, the Federal Reserve giveth and the Federal Reserve taketh away, right? My name is Russ Fitzpatrick, and I'm one of the founders of the Annie Mac Works Real Estate Productivity Platform. The first thing I want to acknowledge is nothing that we talk about today is going to try to upsell you or convince you of something. Um, we're completely sponsored by Annie Mac Home Mortgage. And the Annie Mac Home Mortgage professional that invited you today is trying to leverage the best practices and experiences of elite residential real estate agents from across the country to pass down some wisdom that may be useful for you to further and improve your real estate career. The first thing that we're going to start to do differently in this type of a real estate market is really start to change the de definition of the word prequal. Prequalification used to mean can the buyer buy a home. We need to start to reframe the definition of prequalification to will the buyer buy a home. And it's a small nuance, but I'm going to use this uh, comparison to help you uh, understand the clues that will, will separate lookers from buyers. And I think that that's going to become a, an important piece of the puzzle. So just on first glance, you know, you get a $600,000 cash buyer who wants to buy a $500,000 home, or you have this 3% down buyer with $15,000 down that wants to buy a 350. At first glance, I mean, most realtors would be just diving towards the $500,000 cash buyer, you know. Um, you find out that the $500,000 cash buyer has a, a 720 credit score, where this 3% buyer only has a 625 credit score. So the clues are starting to build up. The retiree on the left-hand side versus he just took a job in town. But he's in the same line of work. He's just new to this town, right? You've got 10 years with the same employer, but he was just transferred in to this new town. And this retired couple just kind of states in a whimsical fashion that they would really like to live here. They really want to live here. Now, this is where the rubber starts to meet the road. The grandkids are back home in their hometown, but they would really like to live here. I meet these folks in, in Hilton Head. I meet these folks in Myrtle Beach. I meet these folks in, in the Smoky Mountain National Park where they're a retired couple. They have enough cash. They can buy a house. The question is, will they buy a house? And using these context clues to separate lookers from buyers is going to become one of the most important skills that we have to adhere to uh, during this next market cycle. See, when interest rates are at two and a half, three, three and a half, four percent, you know, if you can buy a house, you're probably going to buy a house. But if you have to pay seven, seven and a half percent interest rates on your mortgage, you're only going to relocate if you have to relocate. And that's going to be the clue in how to profit from buyers in this next era. So the last question I asked the client is, when would they like to buy a house? And as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, this guy says, my wife and kids are already here. I've already started my new job. I've been with my employer for 10 years. I've got $15,000 to put down. I've got a 625 credit score. And I really need to be in this house before Thanksgiving for sure. Where the other couple kind of says, as soon as we find the perfect home, that's when we're going to make our decision. Well, I would just say for return on invested time and the return on investment in profiting from buyers, the, 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 the pre-qualification definition is the key, right? The red ink on your left says, can this buyer purchase a home? Are they able to financially afford the home? And would they qualify for the property? And the answer for all of those is obviously yes. And that's what sends rookies and low earners 
chasing these, these, you know, maybe buyers all around town for weeks and weeks at a time. Where when we separate lookers from buyers, we find out will this buyer purchase a home? Are they committed to move into a new home by a certain date or time frame? And is there a good reason that they're relocating to this place? And if if the answers to the ones on the right begin begin, begin to become the litmus test for whether we're going to spend time with a consumer, we're going to be richly rewarded as realtors. So as we start to study how to profit from buyers, I want to start to explore how to build a relationship out of thin air where the consumer will start to become vulnerable, start to become more transparent, and start to really confide in you uh, as their real estate expert. And we can achieve this on the first call as long as we do some proper preparation. So I'm going to advise you to never call your buyer back unless you have the listing in front of you on the one that they're calling on. And it takes just a little due diligence on your phone or on your computer to just to make sure you have that listing in front of you so that you can be absolutely the expert to answer all the questions on the property that they're calling on. I never want to say, let me call you back with those answers because I have a chance at bat with this consumer to really build some rapport and to build some credibility. It only takes me about a minute to find some bump to properties that I'm going to share with the consumer while we're on the phone because I can whet their appetite and get them more excited if I have more than one property to talk to them about. And the bump to property uh, process, we're going to explore a little bit later, but it's one of the key attributes to getting a consumer to really open up to you and to really become vulnerable and transparent with their situation and explain to you why they're buying a house, not just if they can buy a house, but when they want to buy a house. I always like to have a couple of other subdivision names to mention in addition to the one subdivision that they called on. So in my community, for example, they might call on Wyndham Lakes, but I could bring up Shadowwood and Oakwood and, and mention some of the character attributes of those other subdivisions with more mature trees and wider uh, sidewalks and large swales and, and, and a different layout of the neighborhood compared to the one they called on so that as we get to know each other, they know that I'm an expert in more than one subdivision. I think you should know about how much the mortgage would be. It's not your job as the realtor to know exactly how much the mortgage would be, but I think that it's fair that you should have some rules of thumb. What I've found is that a $300,000 house in 2023 probably costs about this much. Um, you know, and if you're financing $400,000, in 2023, it probably is going to cost about this much. Having those rules of thumb at your disposal are going to be really helpful just to answer some general questions about their mortgage. You also need to know about special financing that they could get if you are in an area that features a lot of down payment assistance programs. Talk to your mortgage professional about that. If you need to leverage grants and, and first-time homebuyer programs, FHA, VA, community homebuyer programs, USDA, zero down programs. Be very familiar with VA. And then later on, we're going to talk about some specialized financing that could really be the difference in them understanding that you're a consummate experienced professional rather than just a gopher that's going to bring them to houses in the MLS. You know, one of the things that I have stressed already in this call and stress in all of my trainings is that no matter what, every single time I'm going to do a bump to process. So when you call me on a 349.9, I'm going to have two or three other houses that are 349.9 as well. So while I have you on the phone, I'd love to mention this one property that just came back on the market. It had fallen through with another buyer. And the only reason I know about it 
is because I was showing it to my sister because I think it's one of the best properties for under 400,000 in the market. I have this rare situation that may only exist for a short period of time. The family's in the process of getting a divorce and we happen to learn that their house came on the market this week. That one's asking 369.9 and that's a hell of a house. Um, one exceptional value that just came on is a bank owned foreclosure. And when you start to say these key phrases, you know, these couple of houses that I showed to someone else this past week, or I'd like to see if this house is still available because the bump to process takes the subject property that they called you on, puts that one right in front and center to see if they're interested. But then there's some other houses that you happen to know because you are an inside information trader. You are the person who's aware of these houses being available. You're not the conduit to Realtor.com and Zillow, which is what they can already access. You're actually the person who's the source of the information, not some computer database. This serves as a fantastic lure to call cast across the pond to get that buyer to really come up and bite with you and really sink their teeth into the fact that it's your relationship, not uh, a particular computer that's giving it. So one more time, the one way that we consistently differentiate ourselves is to talk about the subject property with enthusiasm and to have that listing in front of us so that we can give them all the details about the bay window and the big mature trees in the backyard and the fenced yard and the pool and the two-car garage and the large eat-in kitchen. Anything that would be enthusiasm and knowledge about the subject house. But then, hey, while I have you on the phone, I wanted to tell you about this bank foreclosure that's coming on the market as early as tomorrow. And I've been told that it's gonna be asking about 340. And if it is, it's gonna be a very good comp for the one that you called me on. The other one I'd wanna tell you about is this 3399 house that I had shown last week to another buyer. It is approved and it is vacant. And it is something that I think that you should see because the one you called me on is great, but I'll bet you that this vacant house that just came back on the market for 339 is going to be something you're going to want to see. And I don't know if you can afford this one, but there's actually a four bedroom. And if I could buy any house for under 400,000, I think this would be the one. Uh, I just showed it to my sister last night, but she still has to sell her house before she can put in an offer. So we're thinking about going like a 369.9 on this big four bedroom. And if, if you could stretch just a little bit further than what you called me on, I would say that that might be a house you'd want to look at. And I'll tell you why the bump to property process is so vital to me as a real estate professional. It's because I want to augment, I want to expand their options monumentally at the onset of our initial conversation. I want to appear to be the source personally, of insider trading information. And I do use the words pocket listings. I have listings that have not entered the MLS yet. I have the, the insider information, the insider trading that goes on in real estate sounds like this. The best properties never make it to Zillow. That is a fact. The best listings never make it to realtor.com. The reality is when a listing agent goes out on a listing appointment on a Wednesday night and sees a spectacular property, he calls his clients first and he practices legal insider trading in residential real estate. And the truth is, is the best properties do not make it to Zillow or realtor.com. If there's another thing we can learn, it's that rookies act as chauffeurs and gophers. Their number one goal is to go out and show property. But the number one goal 
of a consultant and an advisor is a if their house is not already on the market that's the best place to meet the client i'd like to stop over sit down with you for a few minutes and talk to you about your relocation uh, you know i think that is the target of every residential real estate agent that's been in the business for a few minutes they want to be in the living room on the listing side of the house that's not currently listed because their consumer is probably going to want to look at the buy now sell later program they're going to want to look at the cash to keys private equity partnership to make that relocation as convenient as possible b would be i'd like you to come into my office or i'd like to meet you at a starbucks or i'd like to sit down with you can i buy you lunch at maybe panera bread around the corner where we could sit down quiet talk this over a little bit and by meeting them in the conference room or at a private quiet meeting place this is a place where you can really talk turkey about their wants and needs you could talk about their finances a little bit more specifically and you can get them on the phone with your mortgage banker if you can't get the client to agree to meet with you at their home the listing potentially that's not currently on the market and you can't get them to meet you in the conference room or at a private place first. I used to use hotel lobbies ad nauseum. I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the you know tourism capital of the world, one of the tourism capitals of the world, and we would have these beautiful you know multi-million dollar five-star lobbies. And I'd say, well, meet me at the the Ritz Carlton or meet me at the Marriott, meet me at the um, you know the the Hilton, and we would sit down in the lobby, and you would be shocked how much privacy you can be afforded in one of these beautiful hotel lobbies. If I can't get them to A or B, then C is firm. I mean, okay, so the next step, I want to get you on the phone with my partner, who's a mortgage banker, and she's going to go through all of your debts against your income, do what's called a debt to income ratio. And that's going to determine how much of a monthly payment you can afford and how much of a monthly payment you're comfortable with. So the very next thing we need to do, I can't even get you in to see a house unless you've got a good, credible pre-approval letter from a mortgage banker. So my mortgage partner is Annie Mac Home Mortgage, and they finance probably 2,500 families a month. And I work with them because they're real efficient and they're real thorough about their pre-qualification. And rather than go out and think we're going to buy a house for $425, I'd like to know that you're going to buy a house for $425. And then I'd like to know what your down payment, your closing costs, and what your monthly payment are going to be before we ever go out and see a house. That makes sense. So I'll get you on the phone with any Mac home mortgage and they'll get you pre-qualified uh, before we go out and see houses. Now, I know a lot of realtors will take the low grade D. You know, I prefer A or Bs, but if I have to settle for a D, I guess I can shrug my shoulders and kick the can down the road a little bit, preliminary meeting and greet, just to show one or two houses before I can convince them to give me a listing appointment on their existing home or before I can convince them to come on in and sit down with me at the conference room or even to get pre-qualified my lender. The first three are the higher priorities. I would rather have them do it. And that's kind of the difference between elite realtors and underperforming realtors is underperforming realtors are always going to D or worst case F. They just get an F. They just take them out, show them houses before they even know if they're ready, willing, or able to buy a house. Real estate professionals and top earners meet and sit down chauffeurs and gophers just take them out and show them the house. So uh, just to make this point one more way, it's not a good goal to take buyers out and show property. In fact, I think that's the number one rookie mistake. It's not useful to invest time or energy showing property to people who don't have to buy a house. You know, maybe they kind of want to buy a house, but they don't have to buy a house. And I think you're going to need to be separating lookers from buyers uh, you know, in a much more efficient mechanism as these rates are a little higher and the market slows down a little bit. 
you know, number four is expand their options monumentally. By using the bump to property process and using unique selling propositions, you're going to get the consumer to open up and be more vulnerable and be more transparent about their intentions. You know, by using an if I could, would you, you know, you're going to get them to respond. So if I could find you a house and get it ready to close before Thanksgiving, would you be inclined to celebrate Thanksgiving in your new home? If I could find you a distressed property that might need a little bit of renovation, would you be open-minded to taking a look at renovation lending products or the fixer-upper process that we see on TV all the time? Um, using timelines and holiday dates and bump to properties, especially foreclosures, distressed properties, divorces in this kind of a market is a great way to get the consumer to engage with you more aggressively. If you can't find the perfect home, would you be open to opening up, up some inventory and establishing a, some instant equity with a renovation project or a handyman special? You know, Magnolia, Joanne and Chip Gaines, these are fixer-upper darlings, right? So houses that have no appliances or need a roof or need some TLC, would you be interested in that? How does renovation lending work? We just need to be open-minded, get a professional to analyze the house before we, we get involved in it, protect yourself with some appraisal contingencies, and protect yourself with good inspections and repairs. But if we're open-minded to the due diligence, the secret to success is that your Annie Mac home mortgage professional can lend you the money to buy that house, subsequently lend you the money to fix that house up, and finally tie it all into one mortgage payment so you're not stuck with going out of pocket with all of your, um, with all of your repairs. So this is called a renovation home style renovation or a 203k renovation loan. These are lending products that did not exist just a few years ago where effectively your Annie Mac home mortgage professional can appraise that house, appraise what it will be worth when it's fixed up and lend you one mortgage on the full amount. So I've done a few of these in my day. I did one down in New Orleans with my wife, Carrie. We bought it for 107. We did $65,000 of repairs. The appraisal came in at 285, and it was 113,000 dollars in instant equity. I can promise you that's a real world situation. They exist all over Pennsylvania, Colorado, Massachusetts, Florida. There's, there's houses that are in disrepair all over the country. We sold that house for 285,000 dollars, and I'm really, really proud of it. Another thing I'm proud of, and I hope you'll be excited to hear from, I run a licensed real estate brokerage in Florida converting up to 4,000 leads per month over the past 36 months. We purchased leads from Zillow, Realtor.com, social media, and Google pay-per-click. I want to bring in my call center manager for just a few minutes to talk about some best practices and real-world experiences that he's facing right now in the real estate market. Well, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to share best practices with realtors all the way across the country. And I know you don't think it's a big deal what you do, but observing what you've achieved in the call center over the past three years has led me down a path to go ahead and, and understand why we do what we do in our call center, but for the audience to understand uh, Chris runs a call center that takes first substantive contact with buyers from all across the country. Uh, over 70,000 leads have come in during the last three years. And of those leads, Chris's team is responsible for transferring live lead transfers to realtors and to mortgage bankers. So the first substantive contact, that first conversation is the tip of the spear. So we felt it was pretty appropriate to share these best practices with the realtors 
that are attending how to profit from buyer leads in 2023. Um, Chris, you buy leads, your organization buys leads from Zillow. Your organization buys leads from Realtor.com. Your organization generates their own leads uh, from organic and Google pay-per-click. Um, before we get in to the nuts and bolts of your script and your objection handling techniques, let me ask you this. What percentage of your Zillow leads did you transfer live to either a mortgage banker or a realtor last month? As an, just as an example, what percentage? So first off, I wanted to, to thank you for, for having me on here. Um, Zillow, Realtor.com, Google Pay-Per-Click, they all behave a, a little bit differently. But Zillow leads last month, for example, uh, we were at a 54% conversion rate um, for the month of October. That means we transferred over 50% of our buyer leads over to either a mortgage professional or a real estate agent um, in the markets that we service. So October was a big month for us, over 50%. Well, I know humility is a big deal to you and you don't want to be puffered up as the leading call center in the country. But when I talk to Zillow enterprise level executives and they explain that their average realtor converts 7% of their Zillow leads, it's it's a real testimony to what we've been doing together over the last three years that more than 50% of your Zillow leads, probably 30 some odd percent of your realtor.com leads and about 20% of your total inbound leads get transferred for either going to show houses or going to get pre-qualified for a mortgage. So from a best practices standpoint, I know you're passionate about training your sales staff on scripting. What is important to you when you open up a new conversation? What's the most important thing that you wanna start with when you're chatting with a buyer for the first time? Well, I think when you're talking about Zillow and, and Realtor.com leads, especially speed to contact is always the, the number one metric, right? How fast can you first off get the information and reach out to the client? Um, the sooner that you can get that client on the phone or make contact with them, whether it be text or email, the, the higher chance you have of converting that lead. So speed to contact is our number one metric in our call center. Um, we usually aim for about 30 to 60 seconds from the time we've received that information to the time that we're on the phone with that client. Um, second would be really opening up dialogue to figure out what they're looking to accomplish, right? And how we can serve them um, as far as achieving their goals. Why did you fill out the information? What was the intention of the call? Um, whether it is starting the process, whether it is getting information about a specific house, how can we address that right off the bat and, and really get into a conversation that's going to be meaningful for them? So it sounds like you accomplish more by asking thoughtful questions than anything that you say or sell to the consumer. Is that pretty fair? Yeah, absolutely. The, the open-ended questions is a huge part of our script, especially within the first 60 seconds of the phone call. Um, how can we open up as much dialogue as possible and understand what the client's looking to accomplish um, before we even try and get into any scripting or selling? Um, it's really learning is is the number one number one goal. I think they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the the thing that I've noticed about your ISAs, the call center group, is they're asking these thoughtful, open-ended questions with no no ulterior motive. They're just like, why did you take the time to fill out the form? What are you trying to accomplish? I've heard one of your main questions is, where do you live now? Are you moving into this area for the first time? Do you already live in the area? And do you own a home now? Is this the first time you've bought a home? These are all just real nice rapport building, light questions to start the relationship going. Is, is that a pretty fair summary? The, the more conversation starters, open-ended questions, you, you'll find the more the consumer is going to start to open up to you. I think if you start the, the conversation with the end in mind, um, it, it's probably not the best way to go about it. How can we best serve the client? Um, and it usually eventually comes around to the, the outcome that you're looking for. So the, the first lesson herein is speed to contact. That's the biggest Achilles heel that I find with realtor community when they when they pay for leads. They don't get on the phone quick enough. 
Number two, start out with thoughtful, open-ended questions. Stop selling and start asking questions of the consumer. But there is a time in your call, and I can almost hear it shift when you transition from the light, fluffy stuff to kind of getting down the brass tacks. Can you touch on how that transition feels in your call center? So it it really starts to open up once you figure out what they're looking to accomplish, right? So if I'm talking to a first time home buyer and they are in a rental property, we find out maybe how much they're paying in rent every month. We find out if they're on a lease or they're month to month, we kind of gauge their timeline. It, it always leads to, so the first step in this process is always going to be understanding your budget and your affordability, right? That's the first step, whether you're six months away, a year away, or even 30 days away, right? We don't want to get you out shopping until you understand your purchasing power and what you have to work with. So it really kind of takes a turn once you get an understanding of their timeline, you get an understanding of how deep they are into the process, whether they're just gathering information or, or whether they're ready to put together that, that mortgage application. Um, but you do see a shift after you, you gauge their timeline and you really understand their intention to get them to understand the budget and the affordability aspect comes first. Right. And if you can get them to understand why that is so important, it, it really leads you down the path of mortgage application, understanding affordability before you ever talk about houses and shopping. Right. We don't want to get the customer excited to go out shopping, get them paired up with a realtor in, until we understand they're actually ready, willing and able to purchase. Yeah, it's almost like separating the lookers from the buyers so that nobody's wasting their time. And, um, you know, instead of closing hard for pre-qualification or using terms like pre-approval or pre-qual, it seems like you guys are always asking thoughtful questions about their budget. What are they looking to spend? How much have they saved up for the down payment, closing costs, those kinds of things. Is is that how you kind of get the, the juices flowing in the conversation a little bit more? Absolutely. Questions about what they feel comfortable paying on a monthly basis and how a, a debt to income ratio, which is a term that not a lot of first time home buyers understand. Right. And when you're talking about a mortgage application, that's one of the most important aspects is, is DTI. So when you talk about what you can afford on a monthly basis and how a, a debt to income ratio is determined by a mortgage professional, and you put that in terms a first time home buyer can understand, you really feel it on the call. You you feel something click in the consumer's head that says, "Oh, that makes sense, right? Yeah. It's my it's my debt versus my my income." Yeah, you you know I've I've noticed that about fifty percent of all of your transfers do a credit pull on the first call, meaning they've built enough interest and rapport and mutual respect with your call center that they're freed up to go ahead and give their social security number on the telephone call. Talk about why you close them for a conversation with a mortgage banker before you close them for a conversation with a realtor and, and what your experience has been over the last few years with sending these out to realtors. You know, why is the mortgage conversation so important at the onset? I think it, it really all boils down to that, that click that goes down in, in the first time home buyer or a, a, a typical buyer's head when they understand why affordability is so important. Right. If you can get them to understand we have to look at your debt to income ratio because that's going to determine your purchasing power. Um, they really feel that there's no reason to go out shopping. Like, like I would terms. say this, Chris, it's what's in it for you. It's not what's in it for me to go get a mortgage uh, approval. It's what's in it for you to go get a mortgage approval. Um, we used to say things like. You know, the only way you're going to know the the nuts and bolts of what your new home is going to feel like is if you know the down payment, you know the closing costs, you need to know the principal, interest, taxes, insurance. Every single aspect of the home ownership has to be understood before you go out shopping because, frankly, no realtor is even going to let you into the listing if you haven't got a pre-approval anymore, I mean, not in 2023, you're not going to be able to go out and see houses uh, without a pre-approval. So you're, you're almost doing it like what's in it for them to get pre-approved, not what's in it for you, right? 
it's uh, it's all to help them gain knowledge and gain an understanding of what they can afford. And if even when it comes down to location, I talk to to buyers all the time that are indecisive about where they're looking. Right. If you can get them to understand the property taxes in, say, Camden, New Jersey, are much different than the property taxes in, say, Hudson County or Essex County in, in northern Jersey. And those property taxes are going to really determine your monthly budget and how much you qualify for. You might qualify for 150 up in in Hoboken or Jersey City, but that purchasing power might go up to maybe 200 or 225 if you're looking in a Camden County or just outside of Philadelphia. So it, it all boils down to um, the, the mortgage prequalification and them understanding their budget way before they ever are, are willing to speak to a realtor. I, I would only take exception to your your financial uh, projections there. There ain't too many houses in either of those counties for under 300000 anymore, right? No, there's not. There's definitely not. Yeah. I, I would say uh, affordability in, in those places are, are definitely a little higher than that. Yeah. So do you have any objection handling techniques that come to mind that would help our realtors? I mean, are you facing stiff objections from your consumers? Uh, and what are those objections that you hear most often? Uh, when I, when it comes down to the mortgage prequalification and putting together the application, a, a credit pull um, is always one of the, the toughest objections to get around. If, if someone isn't willing to pull their credit, I think getting them to understand the it is a hard credit inquiry, but the impact on your credit may not be what you think, right? And, and the only way that you're going to get any valuable information from a mortgage professional and really understand your budget more than a, an online mortgage calculator is to calculate that debt to income ratio. Determine your income compared to your debts. And the only way to do that is, is by having a mortgage professional look at your credit. Okay. And if they're not serious enough to talk about credit and talk about income and, and liabilities, they're, they're probably not, not that serious about purchasing. Right. So we want to address that head on. Um, we want to take their objections. We want to comfort the buyer, obviously, and give them the knowledge that that they need to make a, an informed decision. But um, at the end of the day, we don't want to waste anyone's time and, and we don't want to waste our own time. So I would say you know, credit pool is definitely the, the highest objection that we get. Yeah. And, and if I'm a realtor doing lead conversion, I don't really have to get into that very much because when I was at Remax, you know, for many, many years, and I, as you know, I, I sold hundreds and hundreds of homes per year. The, the interesting thing is I would stress the affordability, the budget, the monthly payment, the down payment, understanding the full context of the economics. And then I would just let my mortgage partner do it. Before we go, and I need to wrap up, what do you think about the new cash to keys program? And how is that playing into the hearts and minds of these young buyers that are buying their first home, some of them, or even a move up buyer who has a house to sell? I mean, are you using cash to keys in conversations with your consumers? 100%. Cash to keys has become a, a huge tool for all of our ISAs, right? Taking a, a buyer who's maybe frustrated in the current market, right? We get people all the time that say, I'm getting beat up by cash offers. I'm having trouble getting an offer accepted. I've, I talked to someone the other day that placed 20 offers on, a, on homes over the course of three to four months, and not one of them got accepted. The realtor's frustrated, the buyer's frustrated. Cash to keys can completely change the, change the narrative of that. So we use cash to keys every day. Every time we get someone who needs to sell a home, it's a buy now, sell later proposition. Um, and whether or not they they use cash to keys or whether or not they use buy now, sell later to to close, um, they may not. They may. I, it, it's the hook that grabs them. Well, I hope the time that we spent with the call center manager was useful for you. I want to do a quick commercial for our Annie Mac Mortgage Professionals to download Simple Nexus Realtor app and keep Annie Mac in your back pocket. Simple Nexus allows for access to your files through your cell phone, creating total transparency and 24-7 access for our realtors. And where I've used it most often is to adjust the pre-approval letter on the spot. So imagine I'm writing a $500,000 offer, but my buyer is approved for $600,000. And if I send over the $600,000 pre-approval letter, it's going to indicate to the seller that they may have some room for negotiations. What I'll do is I'll 
edit the pre-approval letter down to the amount of the offer. And the reason that we do that is to adjust the perception of negotiating leverage from the seller back to our buyers. It's called editing the pre-approval letter on the spot. So if I'm writing an offer on Sunday night or on the weekend morning, I might not be able to reach my mortgage professional every single time. What Simple Nexus allows us to do at Animac Home Mortgage is to keep Animac in your back pocket and have some 24-7 access no matter what time of day or night you're writing your offers. You can access every element of your transaction and all the benchmarks. I'm going to end my session with you with some of the cute, commonsensical things that I used to do as a realtor, see if they're helpful for you. Never took a buyer out without a clean car. I think it's an image issue. If they have children, I always brought a Nintendo or a little Game Boy with me so that the kids had something to do while we were driving around all day. Um, Carrie had created a coloring book for our real estate brokerage for the, the, the child to draw and color their new home. Those coloring books were a hit for our brokerage for decades. I just think it's just a neat gesture. And sometimes we're in the gesture business, aren't we? Sometimes we're in the raise their right eyebrow business. When our car is spotless, when we bring a Game Boy for their kids, when we bring a coloring book for their young children, I used to bring a, an identical clipboard for the husband and the wife. And then I'd bring an identical clipboard for the kids so they could put their notes about any of the houses that we saw. And when I'm showing property, I'm telling you what, that was one of the friendliest gestures that I ever made that, that the consumers really responded positively to and helped become one of the reasons I, I was a very well-received and well-respected real estate agent in my community um, to give the eight-year-old a clipboard the same as you do the mom and the dad. It just goes a long way to impress the mom and dad. And if it's a hot summer day or an icy, cold, frosty day, be considerate. Maybe keep a cooler of ice water in your trunk so you can open it up and surprise them with a cold bottle of ice water after two or three showings. If it's a frigid uh, afternoon in your market, possibly have some comfortable blankets uh, or some, some hand warmers or some, uh, some hot cocoa in a thermos. It would just elate the buyers and, and, and make such an impact on them that you were so thoughtful to think of their child, to think of their, you know, to think of their needs and their comfort while you were out showing houses. The big lesson here is separate lookers from buyers. You know, don't be so caught up in the, the big dollar down, high credit score consumers, you know, that are buying half a million and up. Rather look at that last line and say, wait, their house isn't even listed yet. And they're not even letting me talk to them about listing their house. They don't seem that serious. They're just a looky-loo. Whereas this consumer, newly married, currently rented, leases up on December 15, finally saved up their, their cash on hand to 10%. They got, you know, 30 grand down or whatever. They're ready to buy and they're sincere about not renting anymore. I think if there's one lesson to take into the changing transitional market that we're in today and might be looking at for the next 18 months is become astute observer of the context clues that let you separate lookers from buyers. That is my story and I'm sticking to it. My, uh, my job is to help you sell more houses on behalf of Annie Mac Home Mortgage. Get those consumers pre-approved with Annie Mac Home Mortgage and you will profit from buyers in 2023 and beyond.